I don't have anything cool to say today as an intro, but let me try. Blood is red, cyanosis is blue. Today I'm teaching on sepsis. I guess that's what you gotta know too. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at neonatal sepsis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are doing videos on the channel. And let's go. Here's a warm-up question, which is an essay question. A 3 kg infant was born to a 16-year-old Para-1 mother. Labor was rather prolonged, lasting 14 hours, and there was prolonged rupture of membranes for 24 hours. APCA score was 7 out of 10, then 9 out of 10 after some resuscitation. Two days after birth, the child developed failure to feed, lethargy, jaundice, and hypotonia. What is your differential diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? List four investigations that must be done in this child to help you confirm the diagnosis. Write two long-term complications associated with your differential diagnosis. What is your management plan? So when you talk about sepsis, I want us to be able to distinguish between two important terms. I want us to be able to distinguish between septicemia and sepsis. So when you talk about sept Septicemia, this is just simply a condition where you have microorganisms together with their toxins present in their blood, actively multiplying and destroying the tissues. That's what we refer to as septicemia. It's a broad term that encompasses bacteremia, where you have bacteria in the blood, viremia, where you have viruses in the blood, parasitemia, where you have parasites in the blood, and fungemia, where you have fungi in the blood then sepsis is pretty much a focus of infection which could be coming from the skin it could be coming from the git it could be coming from the respiratory system it could be coming from the genitourinary system plus features of sars which is your systemic inflammatory response syndrome so a focus of infection plus sars is going to be equal to sepsis and remember that the neonatal period is a period between birth and the first 28 days of life so when we refer to neonatal sepsis, this is just a neonatal infection. Specifically, we usually denote the term to be bacterial infection in the bloodstream during the neonatal period. Previously, we used to refer to this as sepsis neonatorum, but it's now referred to just as neonatal sepsis. It's going to be encompassing a systemic bacterial infection that's going to incorporate septicemia, pneumonia, and meningitis. And remember that neonates are particularly susceptible to bacterial sepsis and the highest incidence is actually seen in those that have a very low birth weight. What are some of the implicated organisms? Group B streptococcus, GBS, it sounds like the name of a party. Escherichia coli, Listeria monocytogens, Klebsiella species, Coagulase negative Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus auris, Acinetobacter, and as well as a Pseudomonas. Keep these important causes in mind because when we come to the treatment, we're using now empirical treatment to target these organisms, especially in a setting where you can't get couches so quickly, you would want to treat this infant empirically and you wouldn't want to wait for the culture results. What are the categories? We can largely divide it into early onset neonatal sepsis and late onset neonatal sepsis. So with early onset, it occurs within the first 72 hours, the first three days. There are some literature that I've come across where they actually divided in seven days, the first week of life and after the, the first week of life. But I usually go with this because that's what our guidelines are actually advocating for. So the first three days of life is referred to as early onset neonatal sepsis. If they get these features of sepsis, then beyond 72 hours, you call that as late onset neonatal sepsis. Now, with early onset neonatal sepsis, the result, it's going to be as a result of vertical transmission of the bacteria before, that's from the mother to the infant, or during birth. So usually you should think organisms that are present in the maternal genital tract. So GBS, E. coli, 
and anything that can be present in the delivery room. There are some risk factors that have been associated, intrapartum maternal pyrexia, that's a fever that's greater than 38 degrees Celsius, chorioamnionitis, you may have maternal peripartum infection, you may have maternal urinary tract infections, you may have a positive maternal high vaginal swab for especially GBS, previous pregnancy with a baby with GBS sepsis, multiple pervaginal examinations during labor, prolonged rupture of membranes greater than 18 hours, and aspiration of meconium that's happening in the background of perhaps a fetal distress during birth, a foul smelling lycra, septic or even traumatic delivery, fetal hypoxia, prematurity, low birth weight, the male gender for some reason, neutropenia, which is due to other causes, and infants are with galactosemia. These are susceptible to E. coli especially. Remember that early onset sepsis manifests predominantly as a pneumonia, and this should make sense because yeah, being born in, in the process of birth, it's easier for these organisms to actually gain access into the lungs because that's the process where you may actually aspirate. The risk of aspiration is actually quite higher than when you are already born. So it should make sense that these should actually be presenting as a pneumonia. Then less commonly, they may present as a septicemia or they may present as a meningitis. Then with the late onset neonatal sepsis, this is after 72 hours. So this one could either be contracted from a home environment, especially the neonates that we already discharged from the hospital, they get a community acquired infection. Then those that are contracted from the hospital, those are going to be contracting a nosocomial type of infection. So usually the infection is transmitted at the hands of the healthcare providers. So this can present as either a septicemia, a pneumonia, or a meningitis. Predisposing factors include prematurity, low birth weight, the male gender, neutropenia due to other causes, just like with early onset neonatal sepsis, overcrowded nurseries, lack of breastfeeding, poor umbilical cord care, central lines, peripheral venous catheters, umbilical catheters, mechanical ventilators, tracheal tubes, superficial infections like pyoderma, umbilical cord sepsis, even omphalitis. You may have also aspiration of feeds and even anything that can lead to disruption of the skin integrity, for example, needle pricks and even the use of intravenous fluids. There has also been some association with endometrial enclosure of the patent ductus atriosum, IV lipid administration with coagulase negative staphylococcal bacteremia. And remember that neonatal sepsis is actually the single most important cause of death in hospital as well as in the community in developing countries. Now, what are some of the clinical features? Here you get so many vague clinical features and they're non-specific. There is nothing that's going to say that, okay, when a child has this, you should suspect that they have neonatal sepsis. So you actually have to develop a high index of suspicion if you are actually able to detect it very well. The rule of thumb that I use for children that can't really speak is two things that are very important to a child. Number one, food. Everyone loves food. So if you notice that this child's feeding patterns have actually changed, this child is no longer feeding like they are supposed to be feeding. They refuse to feed. There's something wrong with that child. Number two, general activity of the child. Generally, children, the parents know the activity of their, their child. The children that are very active and the children that are not so active. So the children that are very active, when they become not so active, then you can tell. Even the ones that are not so active, you can tell that, okay, this is beyond the level that this baby actually is supposed to be at. So those are the two things that you should keep in mind with the very, very young children. So you may have features like temperature instability, hypo or hyperthermia. You may have changes in behavior, lethargy, irritability, or changes in tone. The baby just doesn't look well. You may also have skin changes like poor perfusion, a capillary refill time greater than three seconds, mottling of the skin, pallor, cyanosis, jaundice, petechiae, and even a rash. You may have feeding problems like I told you, poor feeding, vomiting, diarrhea, which is uncommon, and abdominal distension, which could mimic necrotizing enterocolitis. You may have cardiovascular features like tachycardia. Sometimes you may have bradycardia, hypotension. Sometimes you may even have circulatory collapse or shock. In the respiratory system, you will have apnea, tachypnea, yeah. 
you may have cyanosis, you may have respiratory distress where there is an increase in oxygen requirement and this patient may actually require respiratory support. In the metabolic system, there may be hypo or hypoglycemia, even metabolic acidosis. Seizures may also be present, but remember that the seizures in neonates are rather subtle and won't be like the typical seizures that you see in the adults or in the older children. Then if the, there is some meningitis that is suspected, there may be a tense or even a bulging fontanelle and the head may actually retract in a position which is known as opisthotonus. Kind of looks like as if it's an exorcism that's being done. Now, an early but non-specific manifestation is actually the alteration in the established feeding behavior. Like I told you, a baby that was active, a baby that was sucking normally, generally will just refuse to suck and they become lethargic and unresponsive. Whenever you see this, then you should have an indication that this child is not so well. Then the heart rate that's above 160 is usually one of the good indicators of sepsis. So this tachycardia can be present actually 24 hours before the onset of the other signs. If they have fast breathing, chest retractions, grunting, this is indicative of a pneumonia. So most meningitis do not have any distinct pictures per se, making it mandatory to suspect that the child has meningitis in all cases of suspected sepsis. So unless if they have specific features like excessive or high-pitched cry, it sounds like the, that of a cat, the, or if they have fevers, they have seizures, they have a blank look on their face, neck retraction, and even a bulging fontanelle the anterior fontanelle, this is suggestive of meningitis. Then they may have indicators of overwhelming sepsis like shock, bleeding, and even renal failure. And eventually, when you evaluate these neonates, there should be some carefully evaluated uh, investigations, uh, and these should be actually judging the site of the primary or the secondary focus, the meningitis, the pneumonia, the urinary tract infection, the septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, peritonitis, omphalitis, or other soft tissue infections should be able to be picked up during your investigation. So what's our general approach for a child that comes in with neonatal sepsis? So remember that you're going to get a symptomatic neonate. So if there's a high suspicion of neonatal sepsis and the baby is hemodynamically unstable, whether they're in respiratory distress or they're hypotensive or they're tachycardic or bradycardic, you want to order for rapid investigation. So do a blood culture, do a chest x-ray if they are in respiratory distress, and when they stabilize, perform a lumbar puncture. Start them on antibiotics. If there is low suspicion of neonatal sepsis and the baby is generally hemodynamically stable, you generally just want to check and correct any hypothermia, hypoglycemia, or any polycythemia or anemia and any late metabolic acidosis, assess the feeding of this neonate, perform a sepsis screen, then reevaluate the patient. If you do your sepsis screen and you find out that it's positive or the clinical suspicion usually persists, you can start them on antibiotics. But otherwise, if it's negative and clinical sepsis is unlikely, you generally want to send them home and advise them to return if this child doesn't improve or this child gets worse. The diagnosis of sepsis is very difficult to make because it mimics many other conditions. It may mimic hypothermia, hyperthermia, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, even late metabolic acidosis or congestive heart failure. Sometimes even something as simple as a nasal blockage can actually mimic sepsis in the neonates. So a careful clinical history, a careful clinical examination with ordering of the relevant investigations is quite mandatory for you to actually differentiate neonatal sepsis and to avoid any other unnecessary use of antibiotics, then the investigation is, requ is not required before you start them on treatment. So a baby that's actually very sick, you can start them on treatment and order the investigations as you go. But you should make sure at least you get the couches before you start them on antibiotics. So get a sample of the CSF, get a sample of the blood, get a sample of the urine. But although these may yield false results because of the low sensitivity of the culture methods and even the presence of you already giving them antibiotics. But still, this is the gold standard for a definitive diagnosis of neonatal sepsis. What are some of the investigations that we're preferably ordering? So remember that the current practice in newborns less than 30 is to perform a complete workup. So we pretty much want to do our urine. So we get our urinalysis. We do urine microscopy culture and sensitivity. Then, of course, 
blood investigations such as a full blood count with a differential count. Remember that in sepsis, you may see a neutropenia or a neutrophilia. You also get blood couches. So generally, these should be taken before you start them on antimicrobial therapy. So after you clean the skin with, of course, your alcohol, your povidone, and then alcohol again, you collect a specimen of about 0.5 to 1 mil of blood that you put in a special culture bottle, which has a culture media in it, a liquid broth, which is about 5 to 10 mils inside the same culture bottle. Then you may also perform a C-reactive protein, which can be done serially 24 hours apart. This actually gives you an indication of the level of inflammation, the extent, because it's an acute phase reactant. Then you do also get some other blood couches. I think this is repeated. And a coagulation panel, a coagulation screen. Get a lumbar puncture. Remember, there are some indications and contraindications of a lumbar puncture. So get a lumbar puncture. Send CSF for microscopy culture sensitivity as well as CSF for biochemistry. Then if the child is presenting with features of abdominal distension, abdominal symptoms, get an abdominal x-ray. If they are presenting with features of respiratory involvement, get a chest x-ray. This may sometimes be gotten to actually pinpoint the focus of the infection. Then other samples like a culture from the endotracheal tube can be done. So the culture of the trachea do not actually predict the causative agent in the bloodstream in a child that has clinical sepsis. Then you place, sometimes you may get the, the placental tissue for culture and histopathology and generally admit the newborn to the hospital and treat them empirically for serious bacteria infections for at least 48 hours until the culture is going to be demonstrating no growth. So what are some of the features that are going to be suggestive of neonatal sepsis? So it may be neutropenia, it may be neutrophilia. You may have increase in the ratio of immature, which you call as the band cells, immature to total neutrophils. There will be an increase of immature neutrophils. You get thrombocytopenia. This is one of a very key thing on the full blood count because you will see thrombocytopenia. This is suggestive of sepsis, especially in the neonates. Then you may get a positive blood culture. You may get a raised C-reactive protein greater than 10 milligrams per liter. Now, what about a septic screen? So this is done in confusing cases. So generally, it's going to be consisting of a leukocyte count. So the total leukocyte count is less than 5,000 cells per cubic millimeter of blood. An absolute neutrophil count, which is less than 1,800 per cubic millimeter of blood. Remember that the differential leukocyte count is going to be showing an increase in the number of polymorphs. And out of these polymorphs, if more than 20% of them are banned cells, more than 20% of them are immature neutrophils, then it is most likely that this is probably a sepsis. Then you also check for haptoglobin, which is also another inflammatory protein. So you have increase in haptoglobin. You may perform a gastric aspirate that will show more than five polymorphs per high power field then the newborn CSF screening should show increased cells as well as proteins in the CSF. You get a C-reactive protein more than one milligram per deciliter and a micro ESR, which will be more than 15 millimeters or even more in the first hour. Then there will be suggestive history of chorioamyonitis, even premature rupture of membranes or other, other things in the history. So the septic screen or the sepsis screen is considered positive if you have two of these parameters being positive. So the value of this sepsis screen is just pretty much for the exclusion of the diagnosis of neonatal sepsis. And remember that the lumbar puncture should be performed in all cases of suspected neonatal sepsis, except for asymptomatic individuals that have been investigated for maternal risk factors. Now, how do we treat these children that come in with neonatal sepsis? So the mainstay management, of course, would be antibiotics, but you need a good supportive care. So you provide warmth and ensure that there's a normal temperature between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. You start them on oxygen with the hood or mask. So if the baby's cyanosed or the baby's grunting, start them on oxygen. So provide sometimes a bag and a face mask ventilation if the breathing is inadequate. You may sometimes use some nasal saline drops to clear out the nostrils in case there's some nasal blockage. Assess the peripheral perfusion by palpating the peripheral pulses, checking for the capillary refill time. Normal is less than two seconds. And the skin color. You may infuse some normal saline or Ringer's lactate, about 10 mils per kg over five to 10 minutes if the perfusion is poor or if this child is in shock. Then repeat the same over one to two times 
over the next 30 to 45 minutes. If perfusion still remains poor in the shower, that's when you may contemplate starting them on dopamine or you may contemplate on starting them on a dobutamine infusion. So you should insert an IV line because they, they may actually become hypoglycemic. And remember, the key thing here is that do not give boluses routinely for hypoglycemia in neonates because there's a risk of rebound hypoglycemia. So you pretty much want to be giving an infusion of 10%, 2 mils per kg. And you provide uh, maintenance fluid and electrolytes as well as glucose at a rate of 4 to six milligrams per kg per mil. You may add potassium to the IV fluids once you, you maintain a normal urine output that, that you desire. Then the enteral feeds should be initiated early. If there is no abdominal distension, the baby is hemodynamically stable, they can actually start feeding. Otherwise, do not start them on feeds. You should consider parenteral nutrition because there's a risk of them developing necrotizing enterocolitis. Administer vitamin K, one milligram IM, then, of course, transfuse pack cells if the baby has a low hematocrit that's less than 35%. Do not use blood or plasma transfusion as a routine basis for boosting the immune system as some medical personnel actually presume. So the diagnosis of sepsis is actually quite difficult and you need a high index of suspicion. So in infants where you suspect sepsis, we should cover them on beta-lactam antibiotics, preferably ampicillin in combination with an aminoglycoside, which is, for example, gentamicin or a third-generation cephalosporin, especially if they do have features of meningitis. Remember that with the cephalosporins, you want to use preferably cefotaxin. You want to avoid ceftriaxone because ceftriaxone has the potential to displace bilirubin from its binding site on albumin. So it has the potential to cause connectorus. It has the potential to cause hyperbilirubinemia, jaundice, and eventually connectorus. So the organisms that are, we're targeting are those that are found in the female genital urinary system. So pretty much your group B streptococcus, your Escherichia coli, your Listeria monocytogens. So that's the rationale behind us actually giving the ampicillin. Then the neonates are also vulnerable to other common pathologies or pathogens that cause meningitis and bacteremia such as streptococcus pneumoniae as well as nasaria meningitidis. But even some uncommon things may be present. So if we're suspecting the anaerobic species, you want to add clindamycin. So if you're suspecting necrotizing enterocolitis or intestinal perforation is a concern, please do add clindamycin. And remember that the antibiotic therapy is going to be made specific once you get the results from your culture. And there is a policy, an antibiotic policy, which is done to determine the organisms by knowing what is causing the infection in that particular neonatal unit or in that particular nursery in the past six months. And these policies must be reviewed. Each hospital has different organisms that usually hang around. So you, your hospital should review these policies routinely. So what, how do you treat early onset neonatal sepsis? So generally, your IV crystalline penicillin or your benzoyl penicillin or ampicillin combined with gentamicin. So the dose in pre term neonates as well as neonates under one week, you want to give 50 milligrams per kg daily in two divided doses. In neonates between one to four weeks, that's about 75 milligrams per kg daily in three divided doses. And then if you're given your crystalline penicillins and you want it in inter million, interna international units, rather not merely international units, international units, you can give 50 to about 100,000 international units in four divided doses per day. Then ampicillin, given IM IV injection or IV infusion, 12.5 to 25 milligrams per kg, six hourly. If it's listeral meningitis, 50 milligrams per kg every six hours. Then with the gentamicin, 2.5 milligrams per kg in two to three divided doses. And remember that the specific choice of antibiotics should be tailored when you actually confirm the infection and change those antibiotics according to the culture and sensitivity results. Then with the late onset neonatal sepsis, our first line, our penicillin or cloxacillin and gentamicin or amicacin. Second line is cefotaxin and cloxacillin. Third line is ciprofloxacillin or meropenem. So you remember that we usually use mer meropenem if there is a meningitis or neck, it's not a common thing that is used. And we use vancomycin only if the patient has a central line that is in place and they are at risk of staphylococcus aureus sepsis because this one is the one that where you may have a methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus. Then if it's community-acquired infection, so cloxacillin or ampicillin and gentamicin for non-CNS infections, crystalline penicillins and cefotaxim 
for CNS infections. If it's a hospital or nosocomial infection, if you are suspecting that there is MRSA, cover them on vancomycin. If you're suspecting an anaerobic infection, metronidazole can work, even clindamycin can work. Then consider fungal species if the patient is not responding to the antibiotics, especially if they are preterm or very low birth weight or they have indwelling long lines. And remember that the blood culture that is negative and a C-reactive protein that remains normal without any other clinical signs of infection, you generally want to stop the antibiotics in 36 to 48 hours. If the blood culture is negative but the C-reactive protein is still raised, you treat them as if they are infected. If the blood culture is positive, then we treat them until there is clinical improvement, until the C-reactive protein remains normal. Generally, that's about 7 to 10 days. If there's meningitis, including GBS, 14 to about 21 days. So if there is a proven pneumonia or there is a proven sepsis, generally 7 to 10 days, and at least 21 days if there's a gram-negative meningitis. And once started, the duration of the treatment should be actually tailored to the clinical circumstance. And if the cultures come back normal, then of course the laboratory incidences are also normal and the patient is no longer showing any signs of sepsis, then you can stop the antibiotics after about 36 to 48 hours. So if there is no sepsis, there is no infection, there's no role of antibiotics. Remember that intensive care and monitoring is key. It's a key determinant of improved survival rate of the neonates. So the outcome depends upon the weight, the maturity of the infant, the type of the etiological agent causing the sepsis, the antibiotic sensitivity, obviously, and the adequacy of the specific and the supportive therapy. And the onset neonatal sepsis carries a higher risk of adverse outcomes. So here is just a schematic, or rather it's not really a schematic, but rather a, a, an extract where there is risk factors and clinical indicators of early onset infection in those that are less than 72 hours. So we can actually use this criteria to see which individuals we can actually start on antibiotics. So in the first group, this is an absolute indication for empirical antibiotics. You must start these individuals on antibiotics. So those that have maternal invasive bacteria infection requiring antibiotics, a proven sepsis or confirmed sepsis, those that have a confirmed or suspected infection in one of the twins, if there's respiratory distress starting more than four hours after birth, mechanical ventilation in a term baby, seizures or any signs of shock, start them on antibiotics. Then you can start them on antibiotics if they have two or more of the following present. Antenatally, if there was pre-labor rupture of membranes, if there was premature or preterm, birth following spontaneous labor less than 37 weeks, they were preterm. If there is rupture of membranes longer than 18 hours, maternal fever greater than 38, or chorioamnionitis, GBS in a previous baby, or even a positive GBS screening or infection in the current pregnancy. Then postnatally, if there is features of sepsis, an altered behavior or tone and responsiveness, feeding difficulties, for example, the child refuses to feed or there's some intolerance, respiratory distress, if there's apnea, if there's an abnormal heart rate, either bradycardia or tachycardia, if there's altered glucose hemostasis, there's a hypo or hyperglycemia, then if there's a metabolic acidosis greater than 10 millimoles per liter of bicarbonate, then or rather no, not really bicarbonate, then temperature abnormality greater than 38 or less than 36, not explained by any environmental factors, then you want to pretty much start them on antibiotics if they have two or more of these being present. Then some complications include CNS complications like seizures and syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, cardiovascular complica complications like hypotension and shock, respiratory complications like respiratory failure, hematological complications like disseminated intravascular coagulation, metabolic complications like hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, electrolyte imbalance, and even acid-based disorders. Differential diagnosis is going to include meconium aspiration syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, pericarditis, which is largely bacterial, pulmonary hypoplasia, respiratory distress syndrome, bowel obstruction in the newborn, congenital diaphragmatic hernias, congenital pneumonias, heart failure, the congestive type, and hemolytic disease of the newborn. Coming back to a warm-up question, a 3 kg infant was born to a 16-year-old Para-1 mother, labor was rather prolonged, lasting 14 hours, and there was prolonged rupture of membranes for 24 hours. APCA score was 7 out of 10, and then 9 out of 10 after some resuscitation. Two days after birth, the child developed failure to feed, lethargy, jaundice, and hypotonia. 
what is your differential diagnosis? So it's obviously neonatal sepsis because of the risk factors that are stated. Birth asphyxia could also be entertained, your HIE. So most likely this child has an early onset neonatal sepsis. The investigations I would order for include a full blood count with the differential, blood couches, ESR or C-reactive protein, and some renal function tests. Two long-term complications include cerebral palsy and learning disabilities. We don't want to refer to it as mental retardation. In my management plan, I generally want to admit the patient, offer some supportive care, so insert an IV line, keep them, the child warm, give them oxygen if they need, treat the hypoglycemia if there's any, administer vitamin K, transfuse if there's any need, plus or minus phototherapy because they do have some jaundice. Then, of course, give them antibiotics, preferably your benzopenicillins or ampicillins combined with gentamicin. I really hope you learned a lot about neonatal sepsis and you enjoyed this lecture. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe to the channel to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.